Hello and welcome to Seattle's King Street Station. Today we're riding on one of Amtrak's most iconic routes, the Empire Builder. From stunning views of mountain passes to vast expanses of the Great Plains, this train has it all, riding 46 hours across seven states and over 2,200 miles of railway. I hope you're ready for a journey unlike any other and welcome aboard the Empire Builder. Our adventure begins in the heart of downtown Seattle. Built in 1906, King Street Station serves Sounder commuter rail, Amtrak Cascades inner city trains, the Coast Starlight, and of course, the Empire Builder. Standing tall above the station building is the 242-foot tall clock tower, modeled after the Campanile di San Marco in Venice. It is an absolutely gorgeous summer morning here in Washington, the sun shining down on Amtrak Cascade's two Talgo 8 train sets. These Spanish-manufactured trains are the only other train sets currently operated by Amtrak, with the other being the Acela sets on the Northeast Corridor. Their shared bogies and low-slung car bodies give them a very distinct silhouette, and their European interiors are unlike anything else here in the U.S. Heading inside, we find ourselves in a beautiful waiting hall. The white walls and tiled floor make the hall feel both like a railway station and a grand ballroom. Although the space is very pretty, the facilities actually aren't that great. There's more than enough space for people to sit and wait, but there's no convenience store around to get a quick snack or drink. Seattle also doesn't have a business class lounge, despite being a larger station. This is especially disappointing considering we would have been allowed access with our sleeper ticket on today's train. We've got about an hour before departure today, which is a perfect amount of time to enjoy a few rounds of today's video sponsor, World of Warships. World of Warships is a massive free-to-play naval warfare game. Command a naval fleet of some of history's most iconic war vessels, enjoy unique weather effects, or work to unlock new ships to dominate the seas. Choose your ship to cater to the game directly to you, whether you favor heavy combat in a battleship destroyer or cruiser, or want to play a more tactical game at the helm of an aircraft carrier or submarine, there's always something for everyone. With the World of Warships, there's always new content just around the corner. New ships, nations, or even ship classes are added every month, not to mention exclusive crossovers like Transformers or Godzilla vs. Kong. Enjoy World of Warships on the platform of your choice. Experience state-of-the-art naval warfare not only on PC, but also on PlayStation and Xbox. Download World of Warships using the link in the description below and command your fleet to victory. And if you use code Happy New Year 2024 during registration, you'll receive a huge starter pack, including a free ship, 300 doubloons, 1 million credits, 7 days premium account time, 3 Santa's gift containers, a New Year constellation flag, and 10 New Year sky camouflages. Thank you to World of Warships for sponsoring today's video, and now back to the Empire Builder. The bell of an approaching train soon rings throughout the station, and in pulls our train, Empire Builder number 8. Leading us from Seattle to Spokane is Siemens ALC42 number 328, one of Amtrak's new national network locomotives. The signs trackside indicate it's time for boarding, and lo and behold, boarding begins a few minutes after our train arrives. Scanning our ticket, we're allowed out onto the platforms and shown to our sleeper car. Our room is in car 831, the second sleeper on today's train. Boarding a sleeper train never gets old. Just knowing you're about to embark on a multi-day adventure in a mobile hotel room will always be exciting. We verify our roomette with the car attendant and can take our first steps aboard Amtrak's Empire Builder. Ascending the stairs, we can head down the corridor to room 8, our home for the next 46 hours. Putting our bags away, we can get settled in for this 2200 mile adventure. Over on the adjacent platforms lie three Amtrak Cascade trains, with two SC44s and a P42 for power. Amtrak Cascades runs down the 467 mile corridor from Vancouver, British Columbia to Eugene, Oregon. As is clear from the destination board, Locomotive 1404 and its consist are headed to Portland in a few hours time. While we wait for boarding to wrap up, we can take a look at our route across the northern United States. 
Our adventure begins heading north out of Seattle, turning east in Everett and heading into the Cascades, the sun setting on day one. We meet the Portland leg of the Empire Builder in Spokane overnight, Whitefish, Montana our first smoke stop on day two. It's a slow climb through Glacier National Park and the Continental Divide, the plains of Montana greeting us on the other side. Sunset on day two comes as we leave Montana, our train traversing most of North Dakota and Minnesota overnight. Wisconsin is our penultimate state en route to Chicago, the Empire Builder making a sharp southern turn through Milwaukee to head down into Illinois, coming to a stop at Chicago's Union Station. We'll cover a total of 2,206 miles over the next two days, with a travel time of 45 hours and 50 minutes. The sign beside us indicates that our train is ready for departure. Soon enough, our ALC-42 powers up, beginning our 2200-mile adventure on board Amtrak's most iconic train. Leaving King Street Station, we're immediately plunged into darkness. The first few miles take us north to Everett, our train passing beneath downtown Seattle to reach the northern side of the Puget Sound. Exiting the tunnel, the beautiful Puget Sound rolls into view. The weather is absolutely fantastic, the calm waters of the Puget Sound glistening in the high afternoon sun. Across the water, the peaks of the Olympic Mountains stand tall. The tallest of these, Mount Olympus, stands at 7,980 feet tall, the 52nd tallest in the state of Washington. Ahead, the tracks curve around the coast of the Sound, our train making good time as we head north. While we're enjoying the Puget Sound, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for 20,000 subscribers. It's been a long time coming, and it feels unreal now that we're here. The journey has been incredible so far, and I cannot wait to see what the future has in store for us. So from the bottom of my heart, I say thank you once again. Truly, thank you. Dinner is our first meal on board the Empire Builder, our dining car attendant coming through to take our reservation. Both lunch and dinner on Western Long Distance trains are seated by reservation only, with the first seating for dinner at 6 p.m. The Puget Sound continues by our side, a lone cruise ship steaming north towards the Pacific. I've never been on a cruise, and who knows, maybe we'll take a look at one on this channel at some point in the future. Edmonds is our first of 38 stops between Seattle and Chicago, the coastal station only a quick pit stop before carrying on. The waters of the Sound continue by our side for another 15 miles to Everett. From our room on the second level, the docks of Naval Station Everett are clearly visible. Out on the docks sit what looks like seven Arleigh Burke-class destroyers. The destroyer class includes four variants or flights, with a total of 73 ships in the class. Moving inland, we make another quick stop in Everett, the waters of the Puget Sound swapped for the rolling mountains of the Cascade Range. Now, if you haven't noticed already, something is wrong with our sleeper. It's just our luck that our coach has a flat wheel, which leaves us with a super annoying clanging sound for the next 44 hours. 
It's a good thing I brought some earplugs, because if I hadn't, I don't know if I would have been able to get any sleep. Our dinner reservation is called as we wind our way through the Cascades. The dining car on today's train is located rear of the sleepers and forward of the coach car. Dinner, as always, is a three-course meal with an appetizer, entree, and dessert. Amtrak's starters include Caprice skewers, coconut-crusted shrimp, and a mixed green salad. For entrees, Amtrak offers their signature flat iron steak, a pan-roasted chicken breast, Atlantic salmon, or a rigatoni bolognese. Non-alcoholic beverages are complimentary during dining service, with alcohol a paid extra. After our pleasant experience with the rigatoni on the Coast Starlight, I decided to go with that again as a main, plus a mixed green salad to start. Our salad comes out almost immediately. It's a standard mixed green salad with a mini brie cheese and a balsamic vinaigrette to go with. Although a little lackluster, the salad is fresh, so I can't complain too much. Outside, the Cascade Range ascends high above us, our train following the valley carved by the Skycomish River. Our entree is soon served, and unfortunately, it's not nearly as nice as our dish on the Starlight. The sauce is watery and bland, and the noodles have been torn apart while the dish was being mixed, so it doesn't look like it was supposed to. The roll is fine, and it helped to sop up some of the extra sauce, but this definitely wasn't what I was hoping for. There's always been a saying that people eat with their eyes, and right now, mine are having a feast on these incredible views outside the window. If only our main course was this good. Dessert has always been an Amtrak strong suit. Amtrak offers three options, a white chocolate blueberry cheesecake, a lemon cake, and the option we'll be having, a chocolate toffee mousse. As I expected, the dessert is amazing. The cake is moist, paired with a rich and chocolatey mousse. The toffee stripe down the center adds a contrasting texture, the flavor wrapped together by the chocolate sauce on top. If we look at just the appetizer and main course from today, dinner sits at around a 4 out of 10. The appetizer wasn't anything special, and the entree just wasn't that good. The dessert, however, was the saving grace, bringing this meal up a whole 2 points to a 6 out of 10. Definitely not the best I've had on board, but it certainly could have been worse. Returning to our room, the river and railway swap sides, the clouds slowly turning from white to orange as the sun begins its descent. The tall evergreen trees form a thick barrier along the tracks, the foliage giving way as we make our stop in Leavenworth. Beside us, the Wenatchee River gains strength, our tracks mirroring the twists and turns of the waterway. The sun has finally reached the end of its descent towards the horizon, the sky turning into one of the most beautiful sunsets I have ever seen. None of this has been color adjusted or edited in any way. This is exactly how I experienced it while on board, so just take a second to appreciate this unreal sunset.
If you're enjoying our ride on the Empire Builder, why not hit that subscribe button? It's totally free and it really helps support the channel. I also want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my patrons and channel members. Y'all are amazing and I cannot thank you enough for your incredible support. If you two want your name in the video or just want to support the channel in more ways than one, then head on over to the links in the description below. The Empire Builder breaks away from the Wenatchee as it reaches the Columbia River, our train pulling to a stop in Wenatchee for our first smoke stop en route to Chicago. Stepping outside, we're met with the closing stages of that beautiful sunset. The deep pinks and purples illuminate the clouds above, reflecting off our superliners for an incredibly picturesque view of our train. Looking down the train, it's clear that at least a few cars are missing, namely the observation car and a couple coaches. That's because our train is currently only half of the full Empire Builder consist. From the west coast to Spokane, Washington, the Empire Builder operates as two trains, with one going to Portland, Oregon, while the other heads to Seattle. The two eastbound halves meet in Spokane around 2 a.m., coupling together to form one long train to Chicago. The main reason I chose the Seattle segment is because the Seattle portion gets the dining car, while the Portland portion gets the observation car. Had we departed from Portland, dinner would have been a flexible dining experience with reheated meals instead of fresh cooked ones. I was hoping to get a look at our ALC-42, but unfortunately the short platform length means our locomotive is well beyond the area we're allowed to walk in. What we can see, though, are three BNSF locomotives out on the sidings nearby. Presumably, these locomotives are used to work local jobs in and around Wenatchee, though I'm not entirely sure. The all-aboard call is made and we can climb back aboard the Empire Builder, our train pulling out of Wenatchee and on into the night. Before heading to bed, it's time for a shower. The shower for roomette passengers is located on the bottom floor, next to the accessible bedroom and bathrooms. As with all Superliner 2 showers, the room is divided into two spaces, a changing area and a shower stall. The dry side includes a bit of space to change, a trash can, and a linen bag. Towels are found outside by the luggage rack instead of in the shower room. Unlike our rides on the Coast Starlight and the Lakeshore Limited, neither shampoo or conditioner are provided, with only bars of soap to help get clean. Turning to the shower stall, we find yet another small but functional facility. The water pressure is surprisingly high, the temperature control for which is working well. The detachable shower head is always nice, allowing me to take a shower without leaning over. It's certainly not perfect, especially without shampoo, but it'll have to do. Returning to our room, the seats have been folded down into their sleeping configuration, with a sleeping pad and bedding laid on top. The lower bunk in each roomette is around 6.5 feet long, which doesn't leave me a lot of extra space at 6 foot 3. The bedding is quite comfortable though, and after getting settled in, it's time to turn out the lights for night 1 of 2 on the Empire Builder. Day 2 begins as the morning twilight sneaks in through the blinds, the sun rising above the mountains to our east. It's about 7am mountain time, our train having crossed into the next time zone overnight. We also missed out on state 2 of 7, with Idaho coming and going around 4am. Of course, we're sitting stationary a few miles north of Whitefish, Montana, our first stop on day 2. Would anyone like to take a guess at the reason for our stop? I'll give you a hint, it's that massive free space in the middle of your Amtrak bingo card. You guessed it, we're waiting for freight. An intermodal train finally trundles past on the main line, our train backing up past the switch to continue down towards Whitefish. It turns out that we were forced to back up because in order to let the intermodal pass, we had to tuck up behind a coal train on the siding, that train now visible out the other side of our coach. This maneuver was affectionately referred to as a duck and tuck by our train attendant. 
Montana's natural beauty has only just begun, the mountains rising and falling in the distance as the sun ascends the sky. Whitefish Lake appears by our side, the tree line breaking every couple hundred yards for a fantastic view of the water and mountains beyond. After passing yet another intermodal train, we pull to a stop at Whitefish Depot, our first smoke stop on day two. The crisp morning air hits us as we step out onto the platforms, the sun just peeking out over our Superliner coaches. We finally have a platform long enough to walk the full length of the train, which means we can get a look at our beautiful ALC-42s. Overnight, Locomotive 304 was added to the front of our consist, 328 now second in command. 304 bears Amtrak's Phase 6 livery, with 328 adorned in the Phase 7 paint scheme. The ALC-42s are some of the best-looking locomotives currently out on the rails, at least here in North America, the flat face of their SC-44 brethren streamlined for long-distance efficiency. 304 definitely needs a good wash, its nose coated in bug splatters. It also looks in need of some cosmetic work, as there's quite a large dent and subsequent paint chip below its right headlight. 328 is in much better condition. Its front end is relatively clean, with no dents to speak of. Hopefully it will remain that way for the remainder of its service life, but with so many years ahead of it, who knows what will happen. Looking down the platform, we see our train has almost doubled in length. The Seattle and Portland segments have now become one, the extra locomotive a byproduct of this extension. The baggage tractor rolls past, the all aboard call is made, and we can reboard ahead of the real start of day two. As we head out of Whitefish, it's time for breakfast. Breakfast on long distance trains is a first come, first serve affair. Service starts at 6.30 a.m. with the last seating at 9.30. If you plan on sleeping in or waking up early, be sure to ask what time zone breakfast is in, as gaining or losing an hour can easily throw a wrench in your morning meal plans. Amtrak's traditional dining offers five options for breakfast. A continental breakfast, French toast, a three-egg omelet, scrambled eggs, and a breakfast quesadilla. I went with the omelet for our first of two breakfasts. While we waited for our meal, the Montana Plains and a few planes rolled past the window, the distant mountains growing ever closer. The tracks meet the Flathead River through Columbia Falls, the waterway our guide through the first half of Glacier National Park. We don't have to wait long for breakfast to be served. The omelette comes paired with a side of bacon, potatoes, and a croissant, plus a complimentary beverage. The omelette was hot and delicious, chocked full of bell peppers, tomatoes, and onions. The bacon was crisp and salty, and the potatoes well seasoned. The plating could have definitely used a bit of finesse, but the flavor was awesome, and it was a great way to start our morning. A solid 8 out of 10 breakfast on day one. While we ate, our train stopped in West Glacier. Despite the crew's warnings to not step out onto the platform, someone of course chose to do so anyways. Said person was of course not on board when the train departed, but lucky for them the crew was feeling generous and stopped the train again to let them back on board. Our appetite now satiated, we can turn our attention inward for a tour of our roomette. The roomette is Amtrak's smallest and cheapest sleeping accommodation. Our room, number 8, is one of 14 roomettes per Superliner car, though only 10 of those 14 are upstairs. The 6.5 by 3.5 foot room includes two bunks, two seats, and enough space for two adults, although I will say it definitely gets cramped with two people. 
Each Amtrak room includes a door with a positive interior lock to ensure security while inside, with blinds for both the door and hallway window for privacy. In their daytime configuration, roomettes feature two comfortable seats. Each can be reclined using the bar beneath the seat bottom or transformed into a bed using the lever on the side. Each seat comes with a single pillow, which is pretty comfortable, though I think you can ask for more if need be. Although the current layout is comfortable, I found it best to fold out one of the two seats into a bed configuration, which creates an awesome lounge chair when paired with the recline of the upright seat. Between the two seats are cup holders for two complimentary water bottles, the tray table, and the safety information card. The tray table lifts up and folds out across the space between each seat and is large enough to hold two smaller laptops. The rearward seat includes a reading light, the room's temperature controls, and the sole outlet. The forward seat includes a reading light of its own, the volume controls for the PA system, and an attendant call button. The single outlet has long since been a problem with Superliner roomettes. For one passenger, it's usually okay, but with two people who often have one or more devices, a single outlet isn't nearly enough. Storage space is limited in each roomette, with a small cargo hold beside the rearward seat and a bit of floor space between the stairs for smaller bags. Above the storage space are two coat hangers with complimentary towels in the two cubbies. The top bunk is stored away in the ceiling until it is needed at night. Releasing the latch allows the bed to fold down, atop which we find the lower bunk bedding and two blankets. Getting up into the top bunk is a little tricky, but it's fairly comfortable once you're up here. The bed is a couple inches shorter than the lower bunk, which means it's a little less comfortable for taller people than its downstairs counterpart, but you do get a reading light and a small pocket for personal belongings. Although it's rather small, the roomette is a great way to travel. It gives all the perks of a sleeper accommodation while still keeping the price relatively low. With our train now well past West Glacier, we have officially entered Glacier National Park, which is hands down the most beautiful segment of the Empire Builder's entire route. Through Essex, we pass the Isaac Walton Inn, a railway-themed hotel alongside the BNSF mainline. Out front, we spot a Great Northern liveried locomotive. Great Northern Railway was the first operator of the Empire Builder, a service which started in 1929. The Empire Builder was Great Northern's flagship train, the service seeing the industrial progression from steam to diesel following World War II. From here, we begin our ascent through the Rocky Mountains and across the Continental Divide. Glacier National Park is home to some of North America's most beautiful landscape, and our train goes straight down the middle of it. I'm doing my best to capture this unbelievable landscape, but the camera just does not do it justice. Let's just take a minute here to really appreciate Mother Nature's beauty.
Another great way to get some special views of our mountain pass is by heading to the rear of the train. Behind us, the tracks twist and turn their way between the mountains. Despite its elevation, this is still a freight mainline, with anywhere from 25 to 30 freight trains daily. As if to prove this, an eastbound BNSF oil train trundles past on the opposite track. The tracks level out as we reach Maria's Pass. The pass is the lowest crossing of the Continental Divide in the Rocky Mountains, with a peak elevation of 5,213 feet. Really, the whole line through the mountains is Maria's Pass, but it's here where the Maria's Pass obelisk is located. Heading back towards the front of the train, we can take up residence in the lounge car. Amtrak's Observation Lounge Car is the premier spot for enjoying breathtaking views on board any train. The car includes a combination of sideways-facing swivel seats and full tables for seating, footrests along the walls, and larger windows that even wrap onto the ceiling for optimal viewing angles from any seat. This lounge car has also been recently refurbished with the new upholstery on every seat. The reupholstering is a stopgap solution while Amtrak waits on its new line of coaches to replace the Superliners in the coming years. The cafe is also located downstairs, which means it gets very busy in here during peak meal hours. From our seat in the observation car, we see the Continental Divide in all its glory. Although known mainly for the Rocky Mountains, the Divide's most prominent feature is its hydrological one. West of the Rockies, the water drains west into the Pacific Ocean, while on the east side, water drains into the Atlantic. This means that from here on out, any river we cross will somewhere, someday, end up in the Atlantic Ocean. East Glacier Station is our final goodbye to the beautiful National Park, but the area does have one more trick up its sleeve before bidding adieu. Just after leaving East Glacier, we crossed the Two Medicines Trestle. The railway bridge first opened in 1900, over 123 years ago, and has been in service ever since. And with that, we say goodbye to the mountains and hello to the Great Plains of North America. For the next day and a half, it'll be pretty much nothing but flat green farmland. Although the land is quite flat, we do get one bit of terrain variation as we cross Cutbank Creek, our train pulling into Shelby, Montana a few miles down the line. Shelby is also where we'll leave off part one of our adventure on the Empire Builder. Next week, we'll be right back here to pick up where we left off, finishing this unbelievable train ride across the northern United States. Of course, I want to say thank you again for 20,000 subscribers. It's been a long two and a half years of work, but to know that 20,000 of you enjoy the content I create makes me strive to produce even more and better videos from around the world. I also want to say thank you again to World of Warships for sponsoring today's video. Download using the link in the description below and use code Happy New Year 2024 for a free ship, 300 doubloons, and more. If you're new around here, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. It's totally free and it really helps support the channel. If you want to go the extra mile with your support, then check out the channel's Patreon or become a channel member. If you too want your name in the video, access to exclusive weekly posts, and even the opportunity to vote on future videos, then click the links in the top right or the description below to learn more. But anyways, that's all I have for today. Thanks for riding with me, and I'll see you in the next one.